you for joining us for today's Iowa Arts Council Art Up. This is Veronica O'Hearn, Grants and Program Specialist at the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council, a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, is your state arts agency, and we are pleased to host Art Ups, which are free professional development events for Iowa's artists, arts organizations, and communities. Today Today we have Leanne Jabowley, Man Manager of Capacity and Leadership Development at the Foundation Center with us. Leanne will present the Grant Seeking Basics for Organizations in the Arts webinar. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items to go over. First of all, all of the lines are currently muted and they will remain so for the duration of the presentation. This will reduce background noise as this webinar is being recorded. We will have Q&A at the end of the webinar. However, if you would like to send questions to the, to the presenter during the presentation, please feel free to do so. And, by, and you can do that by using the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also use this chat feature if you are having any technical difficulties. Well, that's it for housekeeping. So thanks again for joining us today. And we will go ahead and turn it over to Leanne. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be joining you today to discuss Grant Seeking Basics for uh, Organizations, specifically arts organizations. Um, so I'm calling from Foundation Center, um, from our headquarters in New York, but we have offices all over the country, and we even have locations um, called Funding Information Networks that might be located near you, and we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. So a little bit about Foundation Center. Our mission is to strengthen the social sector by advancing knowledge about philanthropy in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, we do this in a number of ways, including classes like this. We also collect a lot of information on grants. Um, we're the leading authority on philanthropy worldwide. So you may have heard of us before as a place where you can find potential grant makers who might be interested in funding your work. Um, and we'll talk about how you can access some of that information and how it plays into your grant seeking. Um, so as I mentioned, we collect information uh, and communicate information about U.S. philanthropy. We can test and facilitate research on the field. Um, we provide education and training, and we also ensure public access to this information. A little bit about me, I, um, along with being the manager of capacity and leadership development at Foundation Center and having the opportunity with, to work with grant makers that way through funding for Foundation Center and talking to them as hosts at our um, training events and things like that. I also am an artist. I'm a choreographer who runs a grassroots dance company in Queens, New York. And I'm on the advisory committee for Dance NYC, which is the art service organization here in New York City. And um, if you're in dance or like a, in, information about research in the arts, check out Dance NYC. They're pretty great and a good example of what you can do with um, really great data in the arts. So, that's a little bit about me, so you know who's uh, sharing this information with you today. Um, but let's talk about what you're going to really learn in the next, let's see, less than an hour. Um, we're going to start by looking at what you need to have in place before you seek a grant. There's certain things that you really want to have ready to go before you even start looking for funding from foundations. We're going to learn about different types of grant makers and how nonprofits are supported. We're going to identify our funding partners. We're going to talk about how you can do that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Foundation Center's resources and how you can use those. So the first thing we're going to talk about is building a credible nonprofit organization. So as you may know, um, when we're talking about foundation funding, or what we call instead of foundations, grant makers, institutional organizations, that are created really to fund um, nonprofits, uh, they're really looking to fund 501c3 nonprofit organizations. And the reason for this is it's an IRS requirement. So um, that's what gives you an advantage. Now, if there are any individual artists or um, organizations that have fiscal sponsorship, um, fiscal sponsorship is a way to fulfill some foundations requirements for 501c3 status, not all but it is a great option. So that's the basic. You need to have that 501c3 status or you know, fit into the funder's guidelines when it comes to those things. The second thing we have to have is a very compelling mission. Now, 
I teach all types of nonprofits all over the country. And um, when I'm in a room and there's some arts nonprofits, I get a little excited. Not that there's any favoritism, but as an artist, you know, I'm, I'm really excited for arts nonprofits to be doing well when we're talking about funding from foundations. So um, what is difficult sometimes is when an arts organization says, oh, well, our mission isn't that compelling. We just make art. And I, I am blown back by that comment because I'm like, no, what we do is so vital to the community and to our society. And you need to be able to really state that clearly. People a lot of times make a comparison. Well, you know, we're not housing the homeless. We're not feeding those who do not have food. How can we stack up? So it's really important that you're able to tell your story as an arts organization as a vital resource or a vital component of your community. Um, why it's very important that you do the work you do and how that, that translates into support. What do you need for support? So having that compelling mission is really vital. And if your organization can't state clearly why you deserve funding and why you deserve to exist, no one else can do it for you, right? So making sure we have a very compelling mission in place, do the soul searching, do a good job of understanding why it is that your organization deserves support because that's really one of the first steps. You also have to have a strong board of directors who are exercising oversight. This is for a number of reasons. One, um, foundations are investing in you, and they want to make sure that the money is used uh, correctly, legally, and also efficiently and effectively. So the board of directors does have to execute fiduciary oversight and, of, of course, oversight over the executive director. So we want to make sure that board of directors is strong. But oversight is not really enough. Um, more and more foundations are looking at board participation, which includes um, you know, attending meetings and things like that, but also will regularly include their contribution, their financial contribution to the organization. Some foundations may ask, is there 100% board giving? You know, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, something else to keep in mind is the makeup of the board. Does it reflect the community you serve? More and more foundations are looking at that as well. So we really need a strong board of directors, that compelling mission, um, having that 501c3 status is basic. So those are the, the key things you definitely need in place. But let's talk a little bit more about what funders are looking for. When we're talking about foundation giving to nonprofits, you know, what really makes them pay attention to a nonprofit who might be applying to them? They're looking for high quality programs that meet a real need in the community. I already mentioned sometimes as arts organizations we might have a difficulty in really identifying this need, but it's key. So taking time to really think about how do your programs fulfill a need in the community or instead of need it could be opportunity in the community. Um, are, and think about who you're serving. Are you serving artists? Are you serving um, the arts going public? Are you serving a particular segment of the population? Are you working around a particular issue? Um, do you support the economy of your, your area? You know, what is the need or the opportunity you're meeting? And do you have high quality programs? That, then to follow up on that high quality programming, do you have a track record of effective program delivery? So being very good about keeping track of any kind of um, credit that you receive from the press, from elected officials, things like that. How can you prove your track record? Um, and one thing I'll note, keep chatting in those questions on the left-hand side of your screen. As they're appropriate, I will pepper those into our discussion, um, but definitely keep sending those in so I can answer them as we go. Um, so we talked about track record of effective program delivery. We want to make sure we have capable leadership. And in the arts, this is huge. Do you have a leader, maybe an executive director, who is familiar with arts organizations? Do you have an executive director and an artistic director? And how does that relationship work? Is it a strong relationship? If you have one person who's an artistic and executive director, how does that work? How does that person have all the acumen necessary to fulfill both jobs? It's difficult, but very possible. You just need to be able to explain how this works. We have to have a strong organizational and financial infrastructure. So um, as I was saying, a lot of times funders think of this um, as an investment, right, when they're giving a grant. 
and the return on the investment are the results of your programs. So in order to have great returns, you need to have that strong organizational and financial infrastructure. Before I move to the next slide, I do have a question that I'll address now. How do nonprofits build the track record of effective program delivery? Um, if they're new, is it a catch-22? So this happens all the time either with new nonprofit organizations or if you're building out a new program at an established nonprofit organization. How do you prove that track record? You want to be able to speak to that capable leadership and what is their track record? What is the track record of the people doing the work? Because the nonprofit might be new, but the people doing the work might not be new. Also, you can point to other types of um, programs that you're basing your program on. Maybe there's examples out there for you. Maybe you can point to business models that have worked for other nonprofits that you're modeling after. Right? So we want to think about those things. And especially in um, what sometimes are called tertiary cities or, or other emerging markets in the arts, right? If, if you can find other cities that kind of look like your city that has had success with arts organizations, you can point to that. So for example, my, my brother danced for a time with Trey McIntyre Project, which had great success in Boise, Idaho. Um, so some nonprofits began to look at their model and be able to say, you know, this model worked, this is why, this is how our community is similar to Boise, and, you know, go from there. So, so we want to be looking at other opportunities to either model ourselves after others and also talk about the wonderful success and track record the people doing the work have had. Okay. So um, the next thing we'll talk about is the world of grant makers and who supports nonprofits. It's more than just what's on the back of programs and um, after PBS broadcasts, right? But I'm very proud of my husband now whenever we go see a show, he immediately turns to the donor page to look at that and start to figure out, you know, who's funding this sort of thing. So even though he's in banking, he's learned from me about this philanthropy side, especially when we go see different arts exhibits and performances. Um, so that's an important source of information on funding, but we want to kind of take a broad look right now and look at the world of grant makers and look at, for 2010, um, and this, these stats have stayed very similar over the eight years I've been at Foundation Center, um, the revenue for reporting public charities. So by reporting public charities, this means that um, churches and synagogues and other um, institutes of of faith that um, do not have to report are not included here, right? But so for reporting public charities, if we look at the income or the revenue, we can see a large chunk of this comes from fees for services and goods from private sources and then some fees for services and goods from government. The reason we show you this slide is not to say this is an ideal set up for your fundraising um, streams of income. This is not to say this is how your funding should look. But it is to show you across the country where is the money coming from for nonprofits. And it's, it's in large part from fees from services and goods because the larger organizations like hospitals and universities, which are the biggest part of our field, also the biggest part of their income comes from fees and services. Um, but we also show this to you to show you that private contributions is only 13.3% of the pie. And if we, we, if we go even deeper and look at those private contributions, the main bit of those private contributions are from individuals. So you can see here, 72% of private contributions actually come from individuals. Only 15% come from foundations. And only 6% from corporations. And bequests, if you're not familiar with that term, it's when someone leaves money for a nonprofit behind in their will. So that actually could go right into individuals as well, right? So, um, so why do we show this? It's to show that if your board is coming to you and says, foundation money is the answer to all of our problems, you might reference this chart and <laughs> explain to them, you know, that the foundations are only a piece of the pie, but we have to figure out our pie as a whole. 
And in order to get foundation money, they want to see that you have money from individuals. They want to see that you have money from corporations. They want to see a strong earned income strategy. And in the arts, we, we have the luxury of having services that we can charge for, tickets we can sell, um, maybe even products we can, we can sell, right? So they want to see a very good mix of what we call funding streams. That's very important to keep in mind. Um, just to take a peek um, at what is funded in our field in general, the social sector, um, we can see the number one uh, funding comes around health, next is human services, and arts and culture is not, I mean, is by far not the smallest amount of money that's being given, um, you know, compared to education at 23.3%. It is smaller, but it's still a, a good chunk of the national grant dollars that go out. So that's, that is comforting, right? <laughs> um, if we take a look at the Midwest specifically, um, it's nice to know that arts and culture kind of stays in the same place. Depending on where you are, this might change. But arts and culture, in terms of grant dollars, we're talking about 10.1% uh, of the $4.2 billion in this chart goes to arts and culture. So hopefully that's somewhat encouraging. Um, this is money from foundations going to arts organizations, to arts projects. Um, it's, a, it's a nice size. So do not be faint of heart as we go into the foundation world for funding, but also think about where is your funding coming from as a whole. We're not relying on one single source. And I, I don't know um, how things are going in your particular state right now in, in terms of this, but in New York we've had a couple um, major dance institutions close recently, and one of them, um, it's been cited that relying on a single source of funding was a major reason for their closure. Whether that's true or not, I don't think they've confirmed, but that's the talk here. So, you know, we, especially because we're not the number one funded institution, you know, in this whole chart, we want to make sure we're building a strong base for everyone. Okay? And yes, thank you. Um, you will get a copy of these slides eventually. Thanks to, for sharing that with the participants. Um, okay, so now that we know kind of where the money's coming from, let's talk a little bit about the different types of foundations. There's private foundations, direct corporate giving programs, and grant making public charities that we'll discuss. Again, this is all private money. It's foundation money that we're discussing today. Okay? So what is a private foundation? This first type of foundation here that we'll discuss is a private foundation. What does that mean? Well, a private foundation is a non-governmental nonprofit organization. They're a nonprofit just like that, like us. The difference is they have their own funds or endowment. They are not raising money. You will not get a card in the mail um, for the Ford Foundation's annual fundraiser. They don't have one. They, they have their own money that then they give grants from that money. It's usually an endowment invested and typically it's the dividends that are given away via grants. They're managed by their own trustees or directors and they're established to aid educational, social, religious, scientific, or other charitable activities. So other social, educational, we've, we as arts organizations fall into all of these different categories depending on what we're specifically doing. But the main thing to know is that this is the definition of a 501c3. So private foundations are formed to support 501c3s. So um, within private foundations, we have different types of foundations. And you might be thinking, okay, this is a lot of um, jargon, this is a lot of definitions, Leanne, why is this important to me? It's because depending on the type of foundation, um, you may approach uh, them differently, right? So an independent foundation is what we typically call a family foundation. This is a, a person or a small group of people start a foundation for a particular reason. Maybe they want to end deforestation. Maybe they want to um, support new works in, in the arts. Maybe they want to fund um, opportunities for everyone to have access to the arts, right? So every foundation is very different. 
Uh, we have a tired phrase that we say at Foundation Center, but even though it's tired, it's very true. Once you know one foundation, you know one foundation, right? And this is to say that every foundation is so different. So really getting to know what each foundation is about is important. Um, these independent foundations are going to be very aligned with what um, their mission is. Now their mission can change over time, but they have a mission, they clearly state it, and you want to find the funders whose mission carefully aligns to the type of work you're doing and the mission you have. Very important. Company-sponsored foundations also kind of run the gamut, but the important thing to know is it's um, money that comes from a company but is in a separate established foundation. So the foundation money cannot flow back to the company. Um, so that's important because though company interest may um, have some influence over the mission of the company-sponsored foundation, it is a foundation, it is a nonprofit, and it, and it is guided by its mission and its board of directors rather than the company itself. Now, an operating foundation, if you're doing a bunch of research and you're seeing operating foundations pop up, that's not necessarily good news because operating foundations operate their own programs. So if you see an operating foundation, you want to investigate a little bit more to see do they have funding that they actually give away? If they don't have funding, maybe they have other opportunities that would be very relevant to an arts organization. Maybe residency opportunities. Maybe they have fellowships or something like that. Um, so we want to keep an open mind, but just know that this is a different type of foundation that it funds its own programs, typically. Other things that are important to know. The 5% payout requirement. So when the... Um, economic crisis hit in about 2008. Um, a colleague of mine was teaching a proposal writing class and he said, why are we all here with the economy like this? Why are we here learning about foundations and proposal writing? And his answer to his own question was, because they are the only entities that are required to give money away. If they have any assets, they have to pay out 5% of those assets. It's a complex requirement. There's averages over a certain amount of time and things. But the thing to know is they are required to pay out to, found, uh, to nonprofits if they have any assets. So that's great news for us. The other great news is they must disclose their total giving and grants through Form 990, PS. So what does that mean? That means they're filling out this IRS form that lists all of their grants and the amounts. From there, it depends on the foundation how much additional information they give. Um, some will give a description of the grant, some do not. But this is where Foundation Center calls a lot of information about the grants that are given by foundations. So we can garner a lot of information about their giving history, the foundation's giving history, by looking at this 990 PF. Luckily, you don't always have to comb through these IRS forms to find out any information, but if you're doing a really deep dive, you can go to the 990 form, or at the very least, you can use some of our resources to look at past grants and look at giving history. I think one of the best ways to get to know a funder's track record of giving and what they really will fund is by looking at what they've given to in the past. So if you have any questions at this point, please feel free to put them in. Um, that's what I'll say about these private foundations, and then we'll move on to um, other types of grant makers. So direct corporate giving programs. These programs are fantastic. This is when a company, instead of setting up a foundation, or maybe in addition to setting up a foundation, will give directly from the company's pockets. This used to be seen as something that wasn't um, very helpful to companies, but now corporations have realized actually having a presence in their community through philanthropic giving um, get, actually benefits them, right? They've found that giving to support organizations that their employees support is very important to them. And it makes employees more productive, it helps the workplace. So these are all reasons, some reasons why direct corporate giving programs exist. And as arts organizations, sometimes we have a unique opportunity to give um, corporations an, uh, um, a very special spotlight in the community, so through sponsorships, by having their name um, across a, a gallery or connected to a performance or an exhibition, 
Um, and then there's even times where a corporation will bring in an artist in residence or a company in residence to do work. Um, a colleague of mine just forwarded an artist an article about um, improvisation, improvisational comedy, and how improvisational comics are actually giving corporate um, workshops. So they're earning income not by performing, but actually by doing workshops to explain how, you know, does improvisation help in the workplace. So we want to really think about the different ways we can engage with corporations through their volunteer programs, through their employee giving, maybe they do matching where an employee gives and the corporation will match that funding, um, possibly through sponsorships. The, the difficult thing is um, direct corporate giving does not need to be reported like private foundation giving because these are private companies that do not have to report what they're giving to. So it may be difficult to kind of figure out who is doing what, and that's where those, if someone's not listed in our database as a corporation, that's where those programs and, you know, hallways where there are plaques for um, the past funders and things, that's where we start to gain that information, keeping an eye out on the news, any press releases from corporations, and really engaging with corporations that have a presence in your community, really getting to know them. Um, another tip I would say is join the Better Business Bureau or join your Chamber of Commerce. You know, you are a key part, as an arts organization especially, you are a key part of the business community, really, in your community. So you want to rise to that level and meet these corporate um, heads where they're at. And that's really going to give you an advantage um, when you're looking for corporate giving. Okay. And then we have grant making public charities. So these are actually nonprofits very similar to us that are raising money and then giving money away. So examples would be community foundations that typically have a very keen interest in arts. Community foundations very regularly have an interest in the arts because they see the value to their community. Um, maybe there's population or issue oriented funds. So for example, the Ms. Foundation, it's not a a company sponsored foundation in terms of the money is not coming from Ms. Magazine. It's actually coming from fundraising. Um, so, and then that's also an example of a company sponsored grant making public charity. Okay? So, the, this kind of landscape is very important to think about. To think about all, who are all these different types of funders that I can approach? Which funders would be best suited for the different types of programming that I have? Because the key in securing funding and also not wasting your time is to do this kind of research in advance. So that brings us to talking about finding funding partners. And as artists, we probably are keenly aware of the lack of, uh, of uh, aesthetic appeal of these slides. We're working on improving them at Foundation Center. So thank you for bearing with us as we impart this information. Um, so when we're talking about finding funding partners, um, you want to start by identifying the funders, um, the funding need at your organization. So it's actually, again, looking internally first before you look externally for funding. Just like I said, we really need to have a compelling mission. We need to craft that and know what it is. We also need to think about why do we need funding? And it's not just, oh, we're nonprofit. We always need money. That's an answer everyone can give. You want your organization to stand out. So how do you make your organization stand out as really an organization that deserves funding by understanding what is it for? And what kind of funding do you need? Do you need money to start a program? Do you need money to evaluate a, a program? Do you need money to um, commission something? Do you need money that's going directly to artists? Different funders will have different um, emphases on these different things. Some funders really care about funding artists. So if you're presenting a program where no direct money goes to artists to that type of funder, that's not going to be a good bet. But the programs that you have where the money is majorly going to support local artists or support the work of the artists you work with, then that's a match and we really want to approach that funder. So it's all in this research, figuring out what are the funding priorities. You want to think about how much do you need? It's not, again, blank check, whatever you'll give us will take. We need to clearly identify what is our budget and where are the gaps that we could use um, foundation or corporate support to fill. When do you need the funds? 
Unfortunately, if the answer is tomorrow, foundation money is not the way to go. Um, this is longer term money, but you, you need a good strategy of when the money needs to be coming in. So once we identify our own funding needs, we can look at the match with the funder by seeing who funds in your area of interest, or what we call field of interest. So you want to be broad like arts, because there are some funders who will fund anything in the arts, not a particular field, or they just fund the arts. There are, uh, most funders are a little bit more particular, right? They'll have a specific um, genre or field or industry that they'll fund, right? And then even within that, for example, in dance, you know, there's contemporary dance, there's ballet, there's choreography versus performance, there's schools. Like, what, what is the interest of that particular funder? So you want to think very broadly, but then you want to even break down narrowly. What are all the different ways you can, you can um, kind of say, talk about the work you're doing? And it's important not to forget, if you're doing community engagement, if you're doing economic advancement of your community, you want to be able to look at funders who do those things too. They might not explicitly say arts, but if you're really serving a, a population um, that typically, you know, maybe doesn't have access to the arts, or maybe you're doing really um, wonderful work around peacemaking through your arts. Who is that population you're serving and who cares about that population? Because if they really care about the population and you're doing a good job impacting them positively, they might not, they're not so interested in how, they're interested in that you're, you're actually helping them, right? So we have to really figure all of this out through research. We also have to look at who funds in my geographic region. Um, funders have geographic areas where they fund, and, and if they only fund in, you know, St. Petersburg, For Florida, excuse me, St. Petersburg, Florida, and they don't fund anywhere else, going to them, even if it's a mission match, is not helpful. What sometimes happens in, in different places across the country, so um, you might see a funder funds nationally. But maybe in your county they don't, they don't give. They've given to every other county around you, but not your particular county. Sometimes it's difficult to get their attention. And you want to see, you know, do they have a track record of giving almost anywhere, or is there a reason they, they're targeting these different counties? Figuring out why they give to particular geographic regions, what do they really mean by giving nationally, um, that's very important. And also, who will provide the type of support I need? Some funders have restrictions around what they will fund. So we want to be clear about that before we approach the funder and before we even start thinking about approaching the funder. If someone only funds equipment, maybe that's not the right funder for this year, but would be next year. So we want to be clear on those things. OK, so once we've started this um, work, there's the first level of getting a long list, seeing who's a match. But then we want to refine the match a little bit and look at how the grant maker funded organizations like my own. You know, the huge opera company versus the local choir, those are very two different types of organizations, right? So we want to see, does a funder give, well, they give to vocal music, but do they give to both size organizations, both type or types of organizations, right? If you're doing a festival, has this funder fe funded festivals in the past? If they fund opera, great, but if they don't fund opera festivals and that's what you're working on, move on to the next person. Maybe there's someone who funds music festivals in general who would be willing to fund this, and another, they might, the opera funder might fund something else. You also want to think about how much does a grant maker give to an organization like mine? They might give different amounts to different types of organizations. Okay, so that takes us through the research component. Um, I will talk a little bit about getting in there with the research, but um, that's the general idea, that we really want to find funders that are a match, who give to organizations like our own, have a track record of this. The proposal is not your place for advocacy in terms of getting more arts funding. There are organizations you can belong to to help that, like Americans for the Arts. You know, um, but you, you want to make sure you're really finding the match before you approach the funder. So let's talk about the application process. You want to follow the grant maker's guidelines carefully. We do not know better than the grant maker. There is a particular reason they have the guidelines they do. Um, you want to make initial contact if you can. 
okay? If they allow phone calls, you're giving them a call and asking them a really great question that is not answered on um, their website. If they're having um, special um, workshops to help possible grantees learn about the application process, you go. Even if you filled out the application before, you want to put your face in front of the funder. You want to be able to put a face with a name and get your questions answered and have meaningful conversations. It's, I've heard this multiple times from funders. It is much more difficult to say no to a human being than it is a piece of paper. You want to network. Sometimes they require a letter of inquiry which is like a full proposal really pressed down into two pages. This is so that they can kind of quickly get to know, could this be a good fit or is it a waste of our time to move forward, right? So you want to think about that, having a letter of inquiry ready when you're starting to apply to places and know how to use it effectively. Um, they may request a full proposal right off the bat. Sometimes they use a common grant application form, which is like a common college application form. You fill out one, add different attachments, and send it out to the different funders. Sometimes they have their own application form. Online application forms are on the rise, especially with corporate funders. So think about those things. Pay attention to deadlines. And also with those online applications, do not wait till the last minute. Because if your upload is not happening with your um, your work sample or you know you get that horrible scrolling button that something's loading for hours and hours and you know the deadline is right around the corner we want to do our online um, applications early as well as our paper applications pay attention to deadlines it's much easier to say no to someone because they missed a deadline than because you have to make a judgment call on their artistic work another thing I'll say about the application process please 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 have good work samples have great samples of the artistic work happening at your organization, through your organization, with your organization. Um, you know, we are in a field that is either visual or aud you know, auditory or what have you, whatever your field is, have good samples because that can really make or break your application. When I review proposals, I sit on some panels to review proposals and um, give funding. Um, I look at the work sample first. Honestly, and if, and if it's terrible, and I don't mean terrible like artistic merit-wise, I mean um, if I can't see it, if I can't hear it properly, if there's feedback, if it's blurry, it's very difficult to overcome that with a proposal. The proposal's got to be the, like the best idea I've ever seen or the most representative of a community or some really standout thing if that work sample is not strong, right? So think about that. Also think about the match between the work sample and the work you're proposing. Because if you're proposing a particular type of work, the funder wants to make sure you can come through on that work. So make sure there's a match. And I've gotten that feedback myself when, uh, when applying to things. Um, you know, oh, the application was great, but the work sample you sent us was so different from the work you were proposing, we didn't see a match. So really put yourself in the shoes of the person making the decision, the shoes of the grant maker to make your work samples clear, your work samples match very uh, clearly with the, the project you're proposing, and having very clear proposals that really outline what it is that you're doing and how it matches with the grant maker's um, interests. Okay, next um, we'll talk about some of the resources that are available to you. So when you're doing this research, how do you find this information about grant makers? Well, you look at the grant makers' information themselves, right? And so let's take a look at a couple grant makers. Um, first, the Paula Krasner Foundation, um, which is an artist-funded uh, foundation, which is great when we see artists, you know, giving back. Um, so what you'll see here is um, there are grant guidelines. And you always want to look at the grant guidelines very clearly. They tell you how to apply. And they also have their online application. So now right off the bat, we know it's an online application. And they have FAQs because online applications may seem more simple, but they are not always. Also at the top here, you'll see they have listing of recent grantees. And even better, grantee image collection. 
so I can actually see the work that they have funded and see how my work aligns with that or is very different from that. Remember, this is not a process in advocacy. Advocacy is awesome, but you want to propose the work that is most aligned with the funder's path giving and their mission and what they're saying they're interested in giving to now. So this is just a great example of most foundations, you're going to have very clear places for grant, line, grant guidelines, very clear places for recent grantees, and if you're lucky, you can actually see right on their website some past grantees work. If you don't have that um, wonderful opportunity, what you'll do is you'll look at a listing of their recent grantees and then I don't know how people did things before Google, right? Then you just go on and Google the artists that have received funding in the past and look at their work samples and if you can, see if you can find the work that was actually funded by the funder you're approaching. Okay. And now we're going to look at um, a different type of funder. We're going to look at the National Endowment for the Arts, which is, of course, a government funder, not a, a foundation. But again, I want to point out, even their website, they have grants listed. So you want to have, you want to have a look at their application information. They have wonderful information about how you manage your award that's helpful even if you don't have an NEA grant. And then recent grants. Again, looking at who's gotten the funding in the past. What is the size of the organization? What type of organization? Are there trends in funding? And the reason I bring up the National Endowment for the Arts is um, the trends in the funding for National Endowment for the Arts do impact funder trends in terms of foundations and other entities giving to the arts. So we want to know what's going on even if it's not, if you're looking for foundation money, you might be like, why is Leanne bringing up a government agency? Because, you know, the trends here really influence the type of funding that's going out across the country. You will also want to look at here, I'm going to go back to this slide, um, funding research databases, of which the Foundation Directory Online is one of them. It's a foundation center resource, and I will talk about where you can access it for free. Um, you can also subscribe to it if you wish, and that's possible if you're a larger organization. That might be better for you than sending someone to the library to do research. Um, it's up to you. There's nonprofit literature out there. Um, there's training programs. Um, we have a program called the Associates Program where we actually can do some of the research for you. Um, but really what you want to be looking at when you're looking for grant maker information is starting with a database, then drilling down to the actual grant maker information. And one other key thing is each other. Really getting to know your colleagues in the field, talking to each other, because they'll be able to tell you things that is not found in a directory. They'll be able to tell you, oh, this program officer really likes to come to matinees as opposed to evening shows. Or, oh, you know, that funder, you know, if you want them to get them to your shows, you really have to tell them three months in advance. They book really fast. That's the kind of information you're not going to get from a directory. So really be an open-minded, good citizen of the arts community and communicate with each other. Um, so a couple of resources I'll point you to at Foundation Center that are online, accessible anywhere, and for free. Foundationcenter.org and grantspace.org. And there's all of these different types of resources there, and I'll show you some screenshots of those. Um, as I mentioned, there are foundation center libraries across the country, but we also have what we call the Funding Information Network, and I'll show you how to access those um, locations. So if you remember anything specific about this class, other than the general tips and tricks, please also know that you should go to grantspace.org. That's G-R-A-N-T-S-P-A-C-E.org. Um, it's our free website for grant seekers. You can see at the top, we have a bunch of different um, areas you can look at. There's subjects, skills, our classroom lists, our upcoming training events. Tools has a wealth of resources, including a knowledge uh, base where you can at, look at frequently asked questions. Uh, we have a blog. We also have an Ask Us button where you can actually chat live with a reference librarian. Um, so that's grantspace.org. You can also um, check it out at our Funding Information Network's this Foundation Directory Online, which is this key research tool with over 100,000 grant makers in it. 
I really encourage you, if you have access nearby, to check it out. Um, going back to GrantSpace, we can go to this Find Us section, put in your zip code, and you can actually find locations near you. And this is a listing of all the Iowa locations here, and then also some other locations, which I know are not close probably to most of you when it's over 133 miles away. Um, but this gives you an idea. We do have different locations throughout Iowa that if you're close by, you can access that directory for free. If that's not very close by and you want some additional resources, we do have regular um, webinars. So you can see this is April. We have free webinars, like this Introduction to Corporate Giving um, that is offered, I think, pretty much monthly. We have fee-based webinars, for example, more asking, less writing, really getting into writing proposals, writing the budgets, and building relationships. Um, we also have a budgeting basics class. We have proposal writing basics class. And so there's a real mix of different things at different levels for you to check out. So that's the Grantmaker resources for you. And just to recap, before we have time for question and answer, which I'm very happy to answer any questions, even if it falls a little bit out of the purview of what we've talked about, if I can answer it, I'm very happy to help. Um, so remember, build a credible organization. If you're starting out, talk about the track record of the people who are working with the organization, talk about the methods you're using. If you've been around for a long time, do a very good job to tell your story. Look for a match when identifying funding partners. Really find the funders that make a, are a good fit. Um, the other thing I'll say to that is be persistent. You know, it's very difficult to get that first grant. And then once you get that grant, do something what we call leverage. Leverage that funding by being a very good partner to that funder and finding out who else you should be going to and how that funder might help you in the future. It's a badge of credibility when you get a foundation grant. So you want to be a good steward of that money and really use it to leverage additional funding in the future. You want to remember that foundation fundraising is just one part of your overall fundraising plan. This is not something that is going to fund your entire organization. You need a, f a strong fundraising plan that might include earned income, individual giving, corporate giving, et cetera. And remember, Foundation Center is here for you. Just like the Iowa Arts Council is here for you, the fact that you guys get these webinars is really astounding and, and very special. So you have something very special in Iowa, and I encourage you to continue to take advantage of this. And cheers to you for being here with us today. Um, and yeah, just, just be persistent, um, know your programs, and do a good job of telling your story. And that's the best way to you know, get that funding. So as I mentioned, grantspace.org, we have that knowledge base there under tools that will answer a lot of your questions. If there are words like letter of inquiry or LOI that just kind of went completely over your head, you haven't heard it before, but you're interested, that's something you can type into the knowledge base and get some quick answers and resources around that. So um, if there are no other questions, I see Rick has a question about a 501c4. So Rick, it depends on the funder. Um, just like some foundations will fund um, independent artists or um, fiscally sponsored organizations, some will fund different type of 501c's but you need to look closely and know that it's not every single foundation and look at their guidelines. So Rick, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions that might come up? We can just type those in. In the meantime, I'm very happy to um, let Joseph say anything else that the Arts Council wants to say before we end. Thank you, guys. Keep doing the good work that you know really improves your communities. Oh, here's oh, one. Here we go. Um, so Kat asks, can foundations get money from other foundations? We've been labeled a foundation due to getting our funding from an endowment. Okay. So Kat, that's difficult. Yeah, you, you want to change that. You, you have to, as a nonprofit, you, um, you want to be getting what we, what's called public support. So showing that it's not just one person that wants your organization to exist. You want, um, you want the support 
for, from the public in general. I can't speak to the specific legal issues um, that you're, you're going through, but you want, to, you want to have that public support beyond the endowment so that you can prove you're actually a nonprofit organization that's seeking funding rather than a private foundation. Because if you've been labeled a private foundation, remember there's that 5% payout, you'd actually have to be giving money away. So because I don't know your exact situation, I can't say exactly what, what's going on with you, but it, foundations typically don't give money to other foundations, private foundations. So you want, definitely want to get that sorted out. And um, you know, think about the different streams of funding that you can get. It, it doesn't have to be equal, but um, you do need funding sources beyond just one place. Um, and that's all I can get into with details there, but definitely seek some good legal counsel um, to help you sort that out, and it's possible. Um, Ken says, please comment on the pros or cons of hiring a third-party fundraiser. Small organizations don't often have the personnel or the resources to do this work. I completely feel your pain, Ken, and um, this is what I have to say about uh, third-party fundraisers. Foundations don't love it, and the reason is sometimes third-party fund uh, foundation, excuse me, third-party uh, grant writers or proposal writers, they um, they don't have a good sense of the the work that the nonprofit's doing, so they might not be able to speak to that work very well or very clearly. Um, funders want to make sure that the the third party fundraisers are not making lots and lots of money on the nonprofit, right? That they're getting paid a, a straight fee that's reasonable, but it's not based on a you know on contingency or something like that. So you want to be very clear when you're using a third party fundraiser. And I would say if you're going to go that route, which is fine because you know a lot of a small, especially arts organizations, you know we're under resourced and we're we're very good at using what we have well. But sometimes in order to take that next step, we need more money. So using a third party fundraiser is fine, but you just want them to really understand your organization and you want to understand your work. So for example, being in this class today, taking a, maybe a free class on proposal writing so you understand what their work should be and you can oversee them properly, that's the best thing. So hopefully that answers your question. If there's something more specific, please feel free to let me know. Um, any other questions? And I, I do thank you all because your time is very important. So I hope there's something that, that you can apply right away in your work. This is Veronica again with the Arts Council. We just want to thank everyone for attending today. And thank you so much to Leanne for taking the time to join us from the Foundation Center. Um, we also encourage all of you to check out our upcoming Art Ups. We will have Janet Brown from Grant Makers in the Arts presenting on um, conversations on capitalization and community on April 23rd. So I encourage you all to sign up for that as well. Um, and again, thank you to Leanne for being with us today. Thank you guys so much for having me.